All right. Well, a quick summary then, if you couldn't understand. Welcome. God bless you. We're looking at John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. The account of uh, Thomas and the Lord appearing to his disciples. And uh, feel free to question, uh, send your questions, comments, interact with us here on our study. And uh, we're going to get underway by reading our passage, uh, chapter 20 of John, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the day of Easter, the first day of the week, Sunday, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails, and the place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Uh, boy, uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, work through this passage. There's so much good stuff. Uh, you never, when you're preaching, try and get to everything in a passage, and I certainly won't do that today at 1030. But we are in a Bible study format, and so we're just going to kind of see how it goes. We'll start uh, somewhat verse by verse or a couple of verses and uh, try and work our way through this. So going uh, back to uh, verse 19 and looking at that real quick, uh, on the evening of that day, so this is the evening of Easter, right? The, the women kind of have, have already come and, and announced to them uh, that Jesus or that the tomb was empty and that they've seen Jesus. And of course, we're told in Luke that even after hearing the testimony of the women, the disciples were slow to believe. It seemed to them like an idle tale, a fairy tale. They were having great difficulty believing that their Lord was risen. And as we talked about uh, on Easter, that's somewhat understandable. Um, after seeing what they saw, uh, there was no doubt Jesus was dead and dead, brutally dead. Um, also, some of their misunderstandings, misconceptions, and wrong expectations probably were working in there to create that disbelief. Um, and so here we are that evening. Uh, they have locked themselves, it says in verse 19, in the room for fear of the Jews. What do you think they were afraid of? Well, um, the same Jews that crucified Christ, had they found the disciples... Uh, would certainly have a similar fate for them. Uh, and we can be assured that they were no doubt looking for them. Um, so they've barricaded themselves in this upper room, terrified of what's on the outside. Not a whole lot different from maybe the situation we find ourselves in right now. Afraid for their life. And then it says, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Now, here's a question that's commonly asked. How did Jesus get in? I imagine it was something along the uh, lines of Star Trek where he beamed in. <laughs> he beamed in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
wow, coming from a Star Wars fan, right? yeah, I, I'm, I'm I, rather I, disappointed you right. made a Star Trek reference. But all right. Um, I thought you said the Force was with him or, sure. or something. Um, he wasn't blue. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so the doors are locked, uh, the, the windows are barred up, and yet it says Jesus came and stood among them. Uh, I think if we look at the original text, it's it's more that Jesus appeared to them. Um, Luke tells us in chapter 24, verse 39, uh, I pulled that up and I'll just read that to you real quick. Uh, Luke gives us a very abbreviated account of Jesus' appearance here. And he says, starting in verse 39, uh, that Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw essentially a ghost. And this isn't the first time they thought they saw a ghost when they looked at Jesus. Remember when Jesus was walking out on the water to them on the Sea of Galilee? Um, they, they had a hard time believing that that could actually be a real person walking on top of storm waves. Sure. And so they thought it was a ghost. Um, and, and so they, they, they initially see Jesus in their midst. Of course, it's a locked room, so they think it must be his spirit. They think it must be his, his ghost, if you will. And this first time, I think it's important that John tells us in verse 20, when Christ had said, peace be with you, Jesus took it upon himself to show them his hands and his side. We shouldn't confuse that with the second instance, eight days later, seven days later, if eight days is using some inclusive Hebrew dating. The, the following Sunday, when, when Jesus shows Thomas the scars because Thomas demands them. I think it's important to note that even though the other disciples, the other ten, because Judas is gone at this point, they don't demand to see the scars, Jesus takes it upon himself to show them to them. To show him them that he is not a ghost, that he is really who he is, uh, that he is bodily raised from the dead, that it is physically him. Here's the scars. Here's the side. It's me standing before you, even with locked doors and locked windows. Um, so yeah, the how we don't really know. Um, you know, I couldn't describe to you how it is Jesus showed up in the room, but it was physically him. It wasn't some manifestation of his essence. It wasn't uh, a hologram, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I don't know. What do they call that thing in Star Wars where they're, they're not really there? A hologram. A hologram. Um, this was actually Jesus. How did he get inside? Well, the resurrected Christ who has defeated death, uh, who has always been, as John 1 tells us, uh, in his glorified physical body, clearly is not beholden as he was in his humility before he was crucified and risen, uh, does not have to obey the laws of nature. Um, they're his laws anyway. Right. <laughs> yes. right? Uh, the creator uh, controls the creation, and that means time and space and, and, and his own physical body. Uh, I think it's also important to note that this means that Christ is forever physically man. Uh, that Jesus did not, and we haven't gotten to Ascension Day yet, but when Jesus went back to the Father, although he came from the Father as the Word, not in flesh from eternity, he returns to the Father and is forever man, forever the Son of God in the flesh. In fact, John would tell us in Revelation that in heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth, the Messiah will, will appear to us as a lamb who has been slain. We will know Jesus by his scars. We will know it's him the same way the disciples knew it was him after his resurrection. He will bear the scars of our salvation. He will bear those marks. And they're not scars of shame. They're his mark of glory. They are his true crown, that he is the victor, that he has done it. Uh, and so it's important um, that that we see that Jesus is taking it upon himself to show them. Right. He's revealing, which very much it fits right into the way that he reveals himself to us so that we can come to faith. Yeah. And, and, and so I, I think, too, to use a little bit of illustration, uh, Jesus doesn't just reveal himself to us in some pristine, glowing, you know, you see those paintings and he's always got a 
halo around right. his head or something. And uh, Jesus identifies himself with his cross. That is his throne. That is his glory. And I think it, we can fully expect, especially considering the circumstances, and I'll talk a lot more about this in the sermon, we can fully expect Jesus to reveal his glory to us in the midst of chaos. I, I have learned more about Christ through my own scars, through the consequences of my own sin, through the struggles, the tribulations. I have seen God more clearly. And it's always in 2020 hindsight, sure. right? I mean, right. no different than anybody else. When you're in the midst of it, you don't want to be in it. But it's in those scars that you can look back and see most clearly the grace of God. And that's exactly, I think, part of, certainly not the primary illustration here, but part of what we're learning is that Christ doesn't reveal us to him, uh, himself to us outside of a broken world. He reveals himself to us inside of a broken world, in the midst of pain, suffering, chaos, uncertainty. Um, and that's a comfort because God comes to us. He doesn't stand outside and say, look harder for me. I'm there. You're just not believing enough. You're just not fill in the blank. He's in it with us. And he's forever in it with us as he forever bears the scars of, of what is our cross, our sin. When he says the first thing he said to them, because they were obviously frightened enough to barricade themselves in, he says, peace to you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how his peace is different than the peace that, you know, we find in the world? Yeah, Jesus himself said that in John 14, 27, I believe it is, when he says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Um, and to understand that, you have to first think about how does the world give peace, right? Um, the world defines peace ultimately, I think, negatively. Right. It's the absence of bad things. That's how we, by default, define peace. It's in contrast to unrest. Um, the peace Christ delivers is one that is above, beyond, transcendent, something more than circumstances. And so it's not dependent upon circumstances. The peace that he gives is a peace that can be had even in unrest. It's a peace that can be had even in the face of death. I mean, that's the, you want to see the peace of God, look at the lamb who stayed silent, who had the peace in his heart and in his soul, even as he sweated blood and agony, even, even as he was tortured, the lamb who had a peace that transcended something even as horrific as the cross. That's power. That's hope. It's, it's, hope is not just make this go away because tomorrow it's going to be something else. Right. Right. As long as we're in this life, it's always going to be something. Christ gives us something permanent, eternal, a peace that surpasses all of that. Now, the word Jesus is using there, and we're going to talk about this more in the sermon, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. And that's just to whet your appetite and make sure you go to the 1030 service. Um, there is, will be a quiz. <laughs> in the Greek, it's erene, and that's the Greek word used in the Septuagint for the Hebrew word shalom. I think all of us have probably heard that word shalom. And shalom does mean tranquility, serenity, peace, absence of conflict, but it's something much, much deeper than that. Um, as we'll talk about in more detail, it's a peace that comes out of chaos. And that's the power of what Christ promises when he says, peace be with you. Um, and, and Christ doesn't say, I hope peace is with you. He says, peace be and remain with you. And, and that's because he's there. Right. He can say, peace be with you, because God in the flesh is standing before them. And that's what Thomas will come to learn. And that's what Thomas will actually proclaim. Not just my Lord, but my God is standing in this room with me, and that is my peace. He is peace, not the circumstances. That's why Jesus can say, I give not as the world gives. What would the world give? It gives the cross. What does Christ give? He gives resurrection. Life. Life. Yeah. Was that a question that popped up there? No, I was to oh, okay. Um, going on, uh, we left off in verse 20. He showed them his hands and his feet, and they were glad when they saw the Lord. 
And Jesus reiterates again. Um, this is very Hebraic. Anytime there's this repetition, like when Jesus is truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, there's, there's something emphatic being um, um, said. And we can always keep in mind that it's a deeper meaning than what you would at first take away. That's the whole reason Jesus would be saying this twice in a row. Peace be with you. Then he shows him his hands and his scars. And then he reiterates again, saying, think about this again. Peace be with you. And it's important, I think, that he reiterates that because now he's going to say something that probably, uh, and I can't remember who I heard say this, is the most frightening text in all of Scripture. As the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. <laughs> Why were they barricaded in the room? Because they saw what it meant to be sent by the Father. They saw the cross. They saw the death. They saw the tomb. And Jesus shows up, reassures them, I am victorious over all of that. And now, just as I was sent, now you're going to be sent like that. And the only way they're going to get through that is with his peace, which is his presence. And that's why he reiterates again, peace be with you. I am with you to the very end of the age. I got through it. I conquered the cross. And because I did it, I'm sending you. And only with me will you do it. So peace being reiterated there, not just for... I really want you to feel this peace, right, in your emotions. But peace be with you because I'm with you. And just as I was sent, I'm sending you and I will go with you. And then it says, when he received, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So he's not just sending them with well wishes, right? He's not just sending them with this, oh, God be with you, right? Yeah, peace be with you. Kind of like we say to each other, like, I hope it's with you. Um, I wish it's with you. No, Jesus says, peace be with you. And then Jesus gives what he promises. He breathes on them, gives the Holy Spirit, and says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. You know, I, I think this is a great bookend because uh, you alluded to it earlier in John 14, where Jesus uh, tells them, uh, that he will be giving peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Just before that, in the verse uh, before that, in John 14, 25, he talks about how he is going to give him the Holy, or them the helper, yes. the Holy Spirit. Yes. So it's a great parallel. Yeah, yeah. He's fulfilling all of his promises. And remember, uh, starting from John 13, when he washes their feet, right? Um, and at the Lord's... Uh, the table of the Lord. John doesn't give us the account of the institution of the Lord's Supper. Okay. Jesus Jesus said a whole heck of a lot that Thursday night into early that Friday morning, laying out in more detail than he ever did before, here's exactly what's going to happen. And, and we talked about that on Monday, Thursday, mm -hmm. a little bit on Good Friday and Easter. And then, of course, as soon as he's risen from the dead, there's no delay. The promise was given, Jesus is risen, and here we go. Um, essentially, Buckle up, boys. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, here it comes. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, he gives them the Holy Spirit. Now, um, what question might someone ask at this point, considering what else happens post-resurrection, maybe in Acts chapter 2? Right. At the, uh, where the Holy Spirit appears as a wind and the, flame, uh, the flames of fire. Yeah, Pentecost. Pentecost. Right. So, you know, you hear this discussion a lot among scholars uh, uh, did did John get confused? Did did Luke get confused? Who wrote Acts? Uh, when did Pentecost happen? Was this actually Pentecost? And then Acts two was Pentecost part Pentecost two. part two. <laughs> uh, um, no, you know Scripture says there are different gifts given to different people for different reasons, but it's the same Spirit giving the gifts. And I think this is what you see happening here. Um, that there are. There are many disciples. We are all disciples. There were 12 apostles, right? 12 apostles, 12 selected and sent by Jesus to go into the world and do this. Um, 
I don't think it should surprise us then that if you want to use the word special, not not in quality, the, the spirit is the same quality given to you and me. It's not more special. But for what they were tasked to do, uniquely, they were given this spirit at this time to go and do what they did. They equally received that same spirit, not a multiplication of it, not in more quantity, but a given the spirit again in a special instance at Pentecost, but it was this time so that the world could see. Because at that time, for Pentecost, literally the whole nations, all the nations were gathered in Jerusalem at that time. And that's what you even hear them say. You know, these guys, uneducated guys, are speaking all languages at one time. And that was to get the point across that this salvation is for all people. Right. So you have the spirit give, being given. I mean, you go through the Old Testament, the spirit of God fell upon him. The spirit of God fell upon him. Um, the spirit, we don't live any other way, right, except by his spirit. And so, yes, they're given this, this spirit for this instance to go and be the apostles who establish the church. And, and what is the church? It is the followers of Christ who have been given an incredible authority that Jesus talks about in verse 23. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What do you think Jesus isn't saying here? I get to decide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me as a man, even as a pastor, right? You want to talk about the office of the keys. Uh, I'm still fallible. I need forgiveness just as much as anybody else, right? So it's not me, Eric J., that uh, holds the keys to your salvation and whether or not you're forgiven or not. Um, Jesus is saying, if I can sum it up very broadly for this context, salvation is going to come to the world no other way than through your proclamation of the forgiveness of sins. And if you don't go tell them, they won't know. If you tell them, then it's through that message that their sins will either be forgiven or retained. And as long as they proclaim the message faithfully, then what they are doing is what has already been declared in heaven. Right? But they're going to make mistakes. We make mistakes. Uh, salvation isn't hanging on the disciples' shoulders at this point because they need to be saved just like everybody else. This is an establishment of the what the authority is that the church has. The only authority that the church has. And it doesn't have it as a people. It has it as those who have been given the words of Christ. The words of the authority. And insofar as we're faithful to those words, proclaim those words, then that is exactly what's happening. I think so many people tend to... You know, you, you mentioned that that was a big, scary uh, uh, passage where it says send. You know, we get us frightened by that as well. Sure. You know, sh should I speak up? You know, should should I share, you know, the, the, the good news in, in this situation? And I think we we often make it about ourselves in, in that we, we're, we're concerned that, well, I don't have the right words. That's what a missionary does, yeah. where as we don't have to have the right words because it's not our word that has right. the power. Right. As I often say, our job as Christians, as a priesthood of believers, as Peter would say, even though there are priests or pastors designated for the public exercise of the ministry amidst God's people, one thing and one thing only, and that's proclaim, not convert, not Keep a tally of all the people that you think you've converted with your message. The church and you have one job. Uh, you know, we, we often pray for the will of God, right? <laughs> and Jesus says, tells us in John 6, this is the will of my Father that you would believe in the one he has sent. I mean, if that's not a dictionary definition of what the will of God is, I don't know what is. And that means you have an answer to your question every time you ask, God, what's your will for me? that you would believe in the one that I have sent. And I'm going to do everything else in your life for that reason and that reason only. Which means we should be doing everything else in our life for that reason and that reason only. We're not saved by how well we accomplish that mission. 
were saved for that. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the, the book Purpose Driven Life. Right. Um, and it's, it's a decent enough book. Uh, I don't think I would agree with everything in there. Um, but I often in jokingly say uh, that I couldn't have written a book on that. It would have been a very short book. What's the purpose of your life? Jesus told you to believe in the one God sent. Period. Close the book, publish it, send it out. <laughs> right? We love to make it more complicated than that. Um, but Jesus doesn't really complicate this. He shows up, shows them his scars, gives them his peace, gives them his spirit, and says, here we go. One of the things that uh, you've confided in me before uh, when we were hanging out. Do I need to cover the uh, microphone? No, not at all. This, this, <laughs> this is PG. No. So uh, it's uh, the fact that every day you wake up, not knowing what God has in store for you, but excited because what an amazing, I mean, if we all could view it as a privilege yeah. that we've been given to confess our Christ, yeah. how different we might think when we start backtracking go yeah lord but not not right now okay <laughs> you know yeah yeah it is it's it's a wild ride um i've done a couple devotionals uh, talking about uh and it's hard for me to believe there are some people that object to christianity and object to heaven because they think it's going to be too boring uh and if there's any argument that shows just the absolute ignorance of who god is the lion of judah you want to follow him? You want excitement in your life? You, you, you want satisfaction, completion, thrill? Wake up every morning and just say, wherever you go. And, <laughs> and, uh, and get ready. <laughs> yeah, and you'll live life with your hair on fire, that's for sure. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then we get to verse 24. And uh, looking at that, how are we doing on time? I don't 15 minutes. All right. Uh, verse 24, now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So this first instance that happened on Easter evening, Thomas wasn't there. Uh, Thomas missed church one day, and what a bad day to miss <laughs> church, right? <laughs> the one day I take off from Sunday, right. Jesus shows up. Um, and and so they tell him, hey, here's what happened, right? Um and uh, Thomas replies, unless I see the marks in his hands, unless I actually touch the marks in his hands, I will not believe. Um, we're often pretty hard on Thomas, right? I think. Um, and, and maybe that's a little bit of defensiveness because we know that that's who we are too. Um, we tend to be the harshest on those that share our own faults in common. Um, and, and I don't think, quite frankly, if the roles were reversed, that any one of the other 12 disciples would have said anything different. Sure. Uh, we were already told that when the women came to them and said, the tomb's empty, oh, and by the way, Jesus showed up and talked to us, they already all did the same thing that Thomas did. So Thomas is not setting himself apart here as more of an unbeliever, if we want to use that term, than the rest of, of the disciples. I think there's a lot to be encouraged by here. This isn't the first time Thomas has spoken up. Peter's usually the one with his foot in his mouth. Uh, and Thomas doesn't really do that. But there's two other big instances you can think of with Thomas. One was when, just not too long ago, with Lazarus, right, mm -hmm. chapter 11, Jesus was telling the disciples, we need to go back there, right? And, and they were like, well, why? Like, you do understand they want to kill you, right? And Jesus said, we work while it's day night is coming and thomas speaks up and says well i guess we're gonna go die with jesus now <laughs> may have been a little fatalistic may have been a little sarcastic but he was gonna go and he wasn't doubting that well, well yeah yeah <laughs> yeah he was convinced that they would right? die yeah um but they went right and the other instance you have is in i, I think it's uh chapter 14 uh, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and he tells his disciples, yeah, it is. Um, you know the way to where I am going, verse 4 of chapter 14. And Thomas is the one that spoke up and said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Would you just tell us where you're going, and then we'll go with you? Um, and, and so Thomas, Thomas almost has this confidence in Christ to be able to be 
skeptical. A, a confidence in faith to be able to doubt, to be able to bring that before God. And I'm certainly not suggesting that here in chapter 20 that, that Thomas is challenging Christ, right? right? But I, I, I think that if you look at him across the scriptures and if we just even look at ourselves, doubt does not mean unbelief. Right. And that's important. Yeah. Uh, doubt, uh, and I've, I said this in, a, in the Eternal Connection broadcast that's going on here probably right now, um, that doubt is a part of a healthy, growing faith. God never expected us to be able to earn salvation through our good works. Right. And he certainly doesn't expect us to earn salvation through the work of faith or believing enough. And that ticks me off, quite frankly, every time I hear that from preachers, is if you just believe, or if you have enough faith. Well, what's enough faith? Who And who has it? Uh, yeah, we, we don't have a meter here. To... <laughs> right. Um, it's Jesus would say, on the opposite side of that, it's the faith of a mustard seed. It's the faith of a child. Um, and so you have Thomas here. Maybe all he has is a mustard seed. Um, and maybe he's even questioning that. But I think there takes at least some faith to even question, right? And especially when I'm ministering to atheists or agnostics and that, however they define themselves, if they're asking questions, I'm encouraged. I'll, I'll go. I'll go to the end of the line with them because because there's at least whether it's ignorant faith, no faith, or inquisitiveness, whatever you want to call it, those questions are being asked. There takes some faith, even if it's just in the possibility that there's a God. To ask questions right about it right and so i think thomas is not separating himself from the other disciples here now that may certainly be how he felt right oh i'm the one that didn't show up to church last sunday and now i'm the one that's left out but yet it's on that day that jesus comes back and don't miss the fact either that even though the other 10 disciples already saw jesus it says in verse 26 that the doors were locked again. <laughs> sure. So even though they saw Jesus, it, uh, you know, and I'm reading a little bit into the text, I admit, but I don't think it's it's too far-fetched that they still went up into the room and locked the doors. Right? Even after he said, here's the Holy Spirit, uh, here you're going to follow me. Here they are again a week later, gathered together. Uh, and that's important to note, too. Here they are again a week later, gathered together in worship. Um, and who shows up again in their midst? Jesus. And his message has not changed. He shows up, stands among all the disciples, not just Thomas, appears again to all of them, and says, peace be with you, and then tells, invites Thomas to put his finger where, where the scars are, right? Um, and then Thomas uh, makes this confession that is the confession of the church. Uh, this is the first time we hear this put together. My Lord and my God. Looking at Jesus not just as teacher and, and promised Messiah, but as God himself in the flesh. Um, that's important because if you start studying scripture and reading other things, you'll start to hear people um, scholars mainly say that the Trinity was a doctrine developed much later. It's right. essentially a Pauline doctrine uh, that over time the Christian church developed this doctrine of the Trinity. It really wasn't believed this early. And yet, here it is. The, the, the week after Christ's resurrection, Thomas is making the confession. And don't miss the fact that it's Thomas, the one who doubted. The one who insisted that he was a skeptic believes, not because he figured something out, but because Christ came to him through his word, yes, through his presence, revealed himself to him. And then it's Thomas of all people that makes that confession, my Lord and my God. And as you were talking about earlier, when it comes to the fear of talking to people, that may be enough. Jesus is Lord. And Jesus is God. That's the confession. You can say it in many different ways, but that's what it is. Um, so, 
Um, I think we have about five minutes left. Five minutes left. Okay. So let's quickly get to the, the wrap up here. We're in verse 28. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I like to think that Jesus had you and me in mind at that very moment. Um, that he was, he was saying that this represents, Thomas represents 99.9% .9 of my people. 99.9% .9 of Christians are going to be those who have not seen Jesus with their physical eyes and yet believe. And they are the blessed ones. They are the ones that have the same peace that he just gave those disciples in the upper room. Um, John then concludes this just because we're running out of time. Uh, and, and I love John for this reason. This is, <laughs> why have I written this and everything else in my gospel? Uh, Jesus did many other signs, right? This one's special. It's after Easter. It's, it's a, got a bunch of wow in it. But John's lumping together everything he's written about and says, these are written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And that by believing, you would have life in his name. Not by anything else. By believing who Jesus is. Even in your doubt. I doubt, Lord, but I trust in you. You know, that prayer of the father with the demon-possessed son that the disciples couldn't cast out. Uh, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Uh, Sean says later on in Acts, the Bereans examined the scriptures every day to see if Paul, what Paul said was true. Acts 17 as an example for us to get into scripture to ask. You know, that's a great segue because I was just thinking of, you know, when we do have doubts, where should we be going? The, uh, the word of God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can go to pastors, you know, for clarification. That's certainly what I'm here for. But uh, neither myself nor anybody has all the answers. Right. Um, I'm not God. We're not God. Um, but we go to the word of God because this word is where Jesus has promised to say, I'm in your midst. Yes, Jesus is in your heart. Yes, he's with you always. But there's a lot of other garbage in your heart, too. Right? Jesus himself said that it's out of the heart of men that come murder, slander, envy, wickedness of all kinds. We can't trust that thing that we feel. We can't trust instinct. We can't trust how we gauge anything with our flesh. We come to the Word, and it's through that Word, the Word of Christ, hearing that Word, reading that Word, that Hebrews ten seventeen says, that's where faith comes from. You want more faith? You want to believe more? Here. And Christ would say, as, we, as is a common verse we reference, is the author and the perfecter of that faith. And he writes faith through the word he's already written. So absolutely, Sean, thank you for that. And where he talks about peace, I think it's in Philippians, the, the, where you alluded to earlier, uh, the, the peace that passes all understanding. It's specifically to help keep and guard our hearts and minds mm -hmm. in, in Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... We, we have to be in the Word. Yeah, and Paul would say that later to Timothy, right? Guard the salvation that has been entrusted to you, right? Fight the good fight of faith. Guard that Word uh, that was given to you by your grandmother Eunice. Right. <laughs> right, that's, that's, that's the gem to protect. So, all right. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, we're going to head off to uh, get ready for our service at 1030 a.m., where uh, the sermon will be entitled Shalom, Peace. And we'll talk more about this passage uh, with a little bit different focus then. Good to see all of you. I miss all of you terribly, especially having this Bible study in person, but God willing, we will be back soon. Uh, peace be with you, uh, the peace of Christ, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Oh. One of the things I wanted to mention real quick is uh, we would love, if you don't mind, uh, we have an archive of our radio broadcast, The Eternal Connection, and we haven't heard much feedback. I mean, we're only, this is our, only our third Sunday, but we would love just to get, you know, what do you think? Are, are, are we hitting on all cylinders here? Or, you know, it's, it's obviously it's not about us, but it, we just, we'd love to hear what you guys uh, have to say about that. And, you know, it, it's always nice to get a little bit of feedback. Yeah, even if it's uh, something could be better. Sure, um, absolutely. So.
Yeah, thank you for that. Okay. All right. God bless all of you. We'll see you in service here very soon. See you later.